Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Prabhat Patnaik, and we are going to discuss the three agricultural bills which have really shaken up the Indian farmers who are out on the streets protesting, as well as the opposition parties. In fact, the opposition parties did want to register their opposition in parliament itself, where they could not press it to a division because the government essentially prevented a vote in the upper house of the parliament, in the Rajya Sabha. Prabhat, two things are very surprising. One is, of course, the fact that they thought about this bill itself. But the second is also the way they have passed it. But let's discuss first what is the uh, significance of these three agricultural bills that they have passed, particularly the first two, which really tries to uh, hand over it by what you have written also, the farmers to the essentially big capital. Yes, that has two very important implications. One is, as you said, the handing over of the farmers to big capital. With the state not playing a role where it can actually come to the aid of the farmers. Because if you think of the Mondays where earlier the farmers used to sell their they were commission agents, which would make sure the farmers were not cheated. The prices at which they sold the produce would be recorded. If those prices were below the prices announced by the government, then there was a mechanism whereby the farmers would actually get their rights, get their dues. Now, if you take trade out of these money, then effectively you are really on to a system of contract farming that basically anybody can get to the farmers and ask them to sell commodities to them at contract prices. And whether the contract prices are being adhered to, whether the contract prices give the farmers a certain basic minimum uh, rate of return or anything of that kind is something which is not uh, monitored by any agency. Therefore, effectively, instead of the state playing a role of defending the farmers' interests, you now have the state withdrawing and you're leaving farmers to the mercy of big capital. The second aspect of it, which is often not sufficiently recognized, namely not only would the farmers be cheated, but in the process, as far as the cropping pattern is concerned, that goes completely out of the hands of the now, for a very long time, advanced capitalist countries have been telling third world countries that you stop growing food grains or you divert land from food grains to various cash crops, export crops, etc., which we need. And as far as food grains are concerned, we are going to sell food grains. Now, this is something which India had got into earlier, PL480 and and, and, and subsequent and the Green Revolution, no matter what you think about the Green Revolution's technical implications, certainly implied that the, that the country was no longer import-dependent. Now you'll have a situation where it's import-dependent for food. And that's a very important demand of advanced capitalist countries, and that is something which actually makes it makes the country extremely vulnerable to pressures from the advanced. So the so, two, so, things, two things yeah. here, one is the fact that the, once the uh, mandis that essentially were regulated, in, uh, that's, that's what it really was, and the MSP became a floor price, even though it is true that the farmers did sell a lot of their products outside the mandis, right. but nevertheless, there was a basically a floor which was decided by the minimum support price. Now, if it is through contracts, and apparently those contracts are provisions for adjudication, et cetera, which a small peasant is not, or a small farmer is not going to be able to exercise. So effectively, the MSP will not be either effective, or it may not also exist over a period of time, even if the government is saying, no, we will keep the MSP. That this bill, if it was, honest in saying that we are going to be still wanting an MSP to be given to the farmers, could actually introduce this clause saying that all prices have to be uh, at the MSP or above and not below it. So that is also 
that assurance has not come even after the protest and the fact that some of their allies have even walked out of the, uh, the oldest ally of BJP, the uh, Shiromani Akali Dal, has walked out of the alliance. Yes, that is, that is one thing. That is actually the farmers being left to the mercy of the market exactly as they were in the colonial times. Because colonial times, agricultural trade was essentially through a, a, a contract system, the Dadon system. And you know, indigo was grown under that system. Indigo and uh, opium. Indigo and opium. Called pres presidency That's right, called exactly. opium. Against which Dinavondo Mitra wrote his famous play. Neil but, Neil uh, now, now what you have is that in addition, you see, if land is a scarce in which it is in countries like ours, in that case, there must be social control over land use. Now, what the earlier system really ensured is some degree of social control over land use. For a start, land could not be that easily shifted from food grain production to export crop production. As a matter of fact, this has happened in virtually every other third world country. And many of the African famines in the recent years are really traceable to the fact that Africa, Africa lost its self-sufficiency in food grain production. They started growing export crops and of course importing food grains and of course, that basically meant that in years in which the export crop prices crashed, they had no money to buy food grains with from the internal market, and so on. So, so a lot of the African famines were really traceable to this fact that land use shifted towards exports. Now, that's exactly what is going to happen now, because if you have multinational corporations, agribusiness coming in, they are not going to be contracting farmers to grow food grains. They would contract farmers to grow flowers, fruits, and, 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 and so on, which at the time may well be fetching high prices. The highly fluctuating commodities, their, their, their prices fluctuate enormously. And therefore, there may be years in which the farmers actually have to starve because of the fact that they just don't have enough to buy food grains with. The country wouldn't have enough foreign exchange to buy food and so on. Therefore, abandoning self-sufficiency in food grains is really a disastrous policy. And that would come if you get rid of social control on land use, which is basically what we see. You know, it's an interesting uh, point that you also brought up earlier, that the PL480 issue, that this also leaves you open to pressures of uh, imperial powers uh, neo-colonial policies and that's what the 60s was the famous ship to mouth argument right, exactly, exactly. that exactly. because wheat exports were coming from the US that they could arm twist India and I right. still remember the Kashmir issue for instance yes. they said settle Kashmir on the terms that we are telling you otherwise PL 480 may not be forthcoming exactly. so effectively that was what led to what you talked about with the green revolution policies Right. And this is Gandhi then deciding that India had to subsidize agriculture. That's when we start talking about uh, the inputs being subsidized in some form, electricity, fertilizers, and all of that, so that we'll get self-sufficiency and therefore the dependence on others for food would go. Otherwise, it was a political opening of India to imperial pressures. Exactly. And you know, the entire arrangement which the Modi government is dismantling today through all these bills was actually put in place around that time. A minimum support prices, procurement prices, the system of procurement, the system of statutory rationing, the dual market in, in food grains that there are certain uh, that everybody gets a certain amount at the issue price. Then if you want more than that, you go to the open market. So everything, every single one of these, apart from the ones you mentioned about subsidy and so on, was really put in place around that time. Of course, refined, improved subsequently, but it came into place at that time. And no government till now, notwithstanding enormous imperialist pressure, has been able 
to dismantle it because, and that's the sticking point in the Doha round of negotiation because they say that, of course, you are buying all this, your procurement operations are really against the free market principles and therefore you should wind them up. And the government of India has said nothing to it till now. Now, effectively, the Modi government is preparing the ground to wind up the procurement operations. It's also interesting that though Doha round, of course, this was a sticking point, WTO at the moment is defunct virtually because Trump has not sanctioned any new uh, appointments for the tribunal. So the dispute settlement tribunal, which is the body which finally adjudicates all the differences, has only, I think, one member left. So effectively, they are not interested in WTO anymore. But we seem to be internally moving to hand over Indian pharma to in foreign capital as well as Indian capital, in this case also yes, Indian obviously. capital. Uh, but interestingly, it is a part of the philosophical outlook of this government. That it is, not, it, it is not that somebody is telling them to do it. Exactly. They actually are wanting to do it themselves. Absolutely. And, yes, 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 exactly. And exactly. it would seem to indicate that their, their belief is that capital, as Modi claims, capitalists are wealth, uh, what is it? Wealth creators. Creators. Wealth creators. Yeah. So yeah. this is a part of their philosophy. They believe that wealth creation will be done by capital. And they will help farming, farmers, and agriculture more than the government support would. This is an ideological belief. Yes, exactly. In fact, I don't think, you know, I mean, while I have ideological differences with, with the Congress and with uh, other, early, other earlier governments, I don't think any government in India has been as innocent of economics as this particular government has been. I mean, this is very clear when you look at demonetization. This is very clear, not only in the introduction of G GST, but actually in the celebration of it by having a, 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 a function in the central hall of parliament and so on. I mean, they, they just, they, they simply don't understand economics. And this is something which is clear, even in the fact that during the biggest lockdown during this pandemic, not really a PESA was made available to the people at large by way of subsidy and so on, which even by, by way of income transfer, which even Trump in America did. So it is, it is really quite, it is not only right wing, but I think it's right wing with very little knowledge of economics. I mean, it's ideological. That's, that's, I think, an important point that people don't understand that we have a government which seems to understand accounts, but not economics. Yes. So if you, if you see this an accountant's view of the economy, but it is not an understanding that the Bahi Khata principle doesn't operate because you have something which can print money, for instance. Exactly. And it's different from that of how any other accountancy principle operates. So th that seems to be the uh, really a tremendous vacuum in their understanding of what you call the economy. Yes, and, and, and their reluctance to listen to any economist, even economists whose views may be quite different from mine. But in fact, the amazing situation now is that there is almost a unanimity among all economists, no matter what their ideological position, ideology enters in different places, but no matter what their ideological positions, Economists at the moment are agreed that the government must increase expenditure and finance it through a fiscal deficit if the economy is not going to get into a very serious problem. But on the other hand, the government doesn't even listen to economists and because I suppose they believe that they know everything and, and that's why. And exactly the same is true in the case of the agriculture bills. I mean, the Shiromani Akali Dal, not only was their oldest ally, but the Shiromani Akali Dal is a farmer's organization, effectively, because their the support base is with the farmers. And you cannot tell them that this is a pro-farmer bill, because they know more than you what is good for the farmers and what is not good for the farmers. It's, it's a remarkable situation. You know, and also at a time when there has been a huge hit of people returning from the urban areas into uh, rural areas, the reverse migration 
that has already taken place. The fact the economy is not bouncing back. There is no so, no so-called V V-shaped recovery taking place. The pandemic still has its effect. At least consumption is not increasing. So in the context of huge numbers now who are now dependent more on agriculture than before, at this point to knock a central prop out of the farming economy, this must rank with demonetization and the various other measures as one of the more foolish measures the government can do. Yes, absolutely. In fact, you know, there is a, there's an interesting point about this farmer's agitation. That there's an agitation that has drawn in not only the large sections of the peasantry, but also agricultural laborers. Now, it is very rarely that in India, in the old days, you actually had this kind of a united resistance of peasants and agricultural laborers because of the various competition between them. But this time, because the entire sector is under a threat, to actually have agricultural laborers joining in all this Rasta, Roko, and various other agitations. So, interesting times because we seem to see this government really take steps against large sections in different ways against the people. But at the same time, in a crisis of this proportion which we are in, the measure seems to be opposite to what the time seemed called for. And this is something which is inexplicable, at not only to economists, of course, most people may not understand the economy, but to common sense. Exactly. exactly. Yes. Thank you, Prabhat, for being with us. And I hope that you will be with us in more of this kind of discussions to explain to, to most people who do not understand economics, what is the direction this government is taking and what are the kind of measures that we really need to have. This is all the time we have for NewsClick today. Do keep watching NewsClick and do visit our website.